Okay. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second in our three-part series of K3 Hub webinars, focusing on a range of topics aimed at helping businesses prepare for the post-pandemic world. My name's Simon Bonney, and I'm a Managing Director in Quantum's Restructuring and Insolvency Team, and I will be your chair for this morning's discussion. Last year, as many of you will know, we merged with K3 Capital Group PLC, and since then we've launched the K3 Hub, a member network for professional advisors developed by us and other parts of the K3 Capital Group, including RAND, K3 Tax Advisory, and K3 Debt Advisory. Free to join, the club gives members access to a whole host of services, diagnostic tools and calculators, insights and news, and CPD accredited events via a bespoke website. You can find out more at www.k3hub.co.uk. Before we kick off, I would like to ask for your patience if we do experience any technical difficulties at all during the next hour or so. The Q&A function is open on this webinar, so please do submit your questions, because apart from anything else, I like to see the panel squirm when there are some tough questions from the audience. So without further ado, let's begin. I'm delighted to be joined today by my fellow Quanta MD, Frank Offnagoro, a financial advisory expert. From Rand UK Limited, we have Adam Boynton, an R&D tax specialist, Carl Holmes, who is a managing director in K3 Debt Advisory, and Holly Bedford, a managing director in K3 Tax Advisory. In our previous webinar around consolidation, we looked at our electrical wholesaler and retailer CS and some of the problems that were, they were likely to have experienced during the last 18 months and a number of matters that management ought to have been considering in order to manage the business. Can we have the, um, oh, have we got the slide up? Ah, oh, there we go. Um, CS is, a, is a, a wholesaler and a retailer with a holding co and separated business of the online and physical. The online's done pretty well over the last 18 months, which I think a lot of businesses experience where they've been able to take advantage of tech. The physical, as you'd imagine, not so well. Um, but in our, in, as I say, in our last um, webinar, we were looking more at, at the issues they'd faced. And the focus of this webinar is more about their emergence. It feels to me a little bit like it's the weather. I'm pretty sure two weeks ago when I was in the doom and gloom of debt, the rain was pouring down. Now the sunshine is out as we emerge and look to optimize the business. So with this webinar, we'll be looking more in the emergence from this period and some of the opportunities that the directors will have to generate working capital and ensure their best place to optimize their business. So without further ado, over to Frank. Let's start Frank with, with directors and management. In order for them to be able to manage the business effectively, what are the main types of information which they should have available to them? Thank you, Simon, and, and good morning to the audience. Um, yeah, so information is key uh, in, in terms like this. And, and, and in terms of uh, a typical list of key information, we range from financial and non-financial, but for now I'll focus more on the financial information. Um, so a starting point has got to be very quickly understanding um, the current financial position of the business. So typically I'd want to understand what does the, uh, the latest opening balance sheet look like from a net asset perspective? Um, what, what level of debt is on the balance sheet and what's the profile of that debt from an aging perspective? Um, equally critically is understanding the short term cash position. So I'd want to see ideally a 13 week cash flow um, and, and the, the relevance of this particular item is it, it gives me as an advisor and the management team a sense of how long they've got. So how much of a runway have they got to look to explore the issues facing the, the business and come up with an adequate plan? And in that regard, Frank, I mean, presumably one of the key points that they're going to be dealing with is, is, is working capital. So if, if, they're, you know, if they're looking at the expansion of growth of, of indeed opening up again, that cash flow is fundamental for them to be able to understand what growth looks like and how much impact it's going to have on money. I think that's absolutely right. So, so again, in terms of, you know, uh, another key critical uh, part of the information jigsaw, if you like, it's also uh, a set of forward looking for financial forecasts. Um, and as standard, I'd want to see an integrated cash flow, profit and loss balance sheet um, set of forecasts. 
uh, for minimum two years time. I mean, I think trying to forecast beyond 12 months, let alone beyond two years, is quite difficult at the current um, at moment in time. However, I would encourage management teams to nonetheless aim for a minimum two year forward looking forecast. And to your point, Simon, you know, that should enable them to understand uh, what are their assumptions around growth, expansion, and what's the associated working capital um, um, and funding, optimal funding makes us required to actually fund that. Um, so ha- go on, Simon. I was going to say, Frank, within that, how important is the business plan? Yeah, it's, it's critical. Um, so um, coming out from, uh, if we take the, the current business that we're looking at in terms of the case study, so they've gone through a period of upheaval, or certainly one part of the business has gone through a period of upheaval. So I think certainly as they come out of that and try to understand what the options open to, them, I think going back to the original business plan and understanding how things have shifted from the original plan is absolutely critical. And I think at this stage, it's really about taking stock of the original business plan, understanding what's shifted and what's moved, and then being able to calibrate uh, or recalibrate, sorry, and come up with a set of options that will take them to the, to the, to the new path going forward. And I suppose there are a number of businesses out there who, who have management who are very good at what they do in, in normal times. Yeah. you know, who are excellent at, at sales, marketing, engineering, whatever it is, their skill set is, um, but, but may feel um, that, that, that something as, as, as kind of seismic as the effect that the pandemic has yeah. means that they're, they're out of their depth in terms of, in terms of navigating choppy waters. And yeah. one option there, I think, is, is, is to look at some form of interim manager, some, some form of turnaround advisor if necessary, in order to assist through that period. So what, what, what's the likely impact that someone like that would have on a business where their skill sets aren't necessarily on the, on the, 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 the business turnaround side? Absolutely, I think that's, that's a very good question, Simon. So if we take um, um, the business in question, so you have two, two, two uh, names to this business. You have an online business, which clearly given where we are in the world is the more relevant business, you could argue, and you have a, a more traditional business model of the physical retail business, which, which is clearly a bit more challenged. Now, certainly as a management team, you know, this range of options you should be thinking about would be, do we, do we seek to dispose of the physical business uh, and focus on a more relevant online business in terms of strategic growth, um, you, you know, getting strategic investor on board, et cetera, you know, or do you, to your point, get a, a, an interim turnaround manager um, to come into the business and, in effect, look to focus on the physical business from a turnaround perspective? Okay. Um, now, the reason why that's critical, at least uh, you made the point um, pretty clearly, is management teams, uh, you know, w- they'll be used to the day-to-day um, of the business, business as usual. So in this instance, you'd imagine the management team would want to focus on the online business, given it's what they know, and given that's where the more, the more viable prospect for the business lies. Now, if they're minded to focus on attempting to turn around the physical business, perhaps because they visit, there is some values to it left there, um, they would need to get external help. Uh, there simply isn't sufficient bandwidth to focus on business as usual and growth and also focus on the turnaround. They're two very distinct disciplines and focuses. Um, so I would strongly advise getting a, an interim turnaround guy um, to come into a business. Now, the benefits of individuals who specialise in that, in that field are they would tend to be specialists by way of sector or industry. Uh, but more critically, they tend to be situational experts. So they will have deep situational experience of working with businesses that are challenged. Um, time is a premium, and they're very adept at very quickly coming up with a plan, coalescing the key stakeholders and implementing that pace. And, I, and I spe- one of the keys there, of course, is, 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 is that plan, isn't it? And, and having a plan and sticking to it, understanding what your goals are, and, and knowing how to get to them. And in that regard, um, that, that working capital requirement is fundamental. So if I may move over to Carl, um, CS, our case study, is a, is a business that, that has incurred a fair amount of, of debt, um, C-bills, VAT deferral scheme, over, over um, recent times, but also 
has a number of assets on its balance sheet, including freehold property, stock, um, book debts that that may have some form of um, or enable them with to to undertake some form of manoeuvring for working capital raising. What are the opportunities, Carl, in terms of in terms of the types of assets and the types of uh, debt that they may be able to obtain in order to provide working capital growth. Thank you, Simon. And uh, yes, good morning to everyone. Nice to join you. Um, so you're right. The, the, there's a wholesaler and retailer business that's got some freehold property. So a, there are a number of assets out there. It's already got a C bills loan, so it's probably given a fixed and floating charge. So we'll we'll, we'll work on the basis that we're, we're looking at a business that's already got a, a, a fixed and floating charge in place. And, and what might they be able to do um, to replace that or, or get some more appropriate um, debt finance in, in situ? So let's start with the with the, the top of the current assets, the, the invoices. Very often a, a, a general debt against invoices will be less generous than an invoice discount uh, facility, which will be very specifically related to the quality of the debts. Now, this is a wholesaler and retailer of electrical goods. So the, even the wholesale, so the retail element won't have any debts. The wholesale element would have debts into electrical retailers. So the quality of those debts is something that would, would, can only be known by looking at the at the ledger in detail, uh, and each uh, lender would look to do that and, and carry out a an understand get get an understanding of the, the underlying quality of the debt of it. So that that's the the best form of of short term work capital finance invoice discounting very straightforward. I'm sure a lot of people have come across it and and, and understand it. Um, and it's a great, it's a great uh, product for when the business is growing, and you can and you can add those invoices into your facility and, and increase the amount of working capital. Stock is a is a has historically been a, an increasingly good way of funding working capital, but that has all changed now. You're the insolvency expert, Simon, not me. So I'm I'm going to leave the questions regarding the new preferential claims to you. But that that has undoubtedly eroded the the ability to generate funding against stock not least in a situation like this where there are vat deferral schemes and and the the hmrc are being supported but in being supportive are allowing companies to run up what will now be preferential creditor claims and will therefore pound for pound deduct what you might get against the stock and and one of the points i think is important to make at this stage you know, frank's touched upon how important it is to have accurate accounting information. That's absolutely right. But accounting information is not the same as a, a loan valuation. So you may have stock on the balance sheet, which costs you, for sake of argument, £100. You can sell it for £200. You'd say to yourself, well, the, the lending valuation of that might be £150, 75% loan to value against the selling price. You're not going to get 75% value. A, a, a loan will be based on exit you valuation, selling the, the stock at auction. Chances are you'll get less than cost Chances are, if you've got reasonable HRMRC level of arrears, you take into account other claims such as retention of title, you're probably not going to get anything from the stock. So that, that's the bad news. So where else can we look for funding? There's property. If there's freehold property, then clearly that will need to be valued. Everybody knows that property valuations are uh, something of a, of a mystery, uh, certainly an art rather than a science. And, you know, that will all depend where they are. If they're retail stores in the centre of town, if they're, you know, little little stores in the middle of a, a, a rundown area that they probably don't have much value. If they've got a distribution centre that's sitting out in the middle of the countryside and, and that that property by all accounts, my friends in, in industrial property tell me that that property is very hot at the moment. So you, you, the, the valuation will depend on location, size, planning, all, all those sort of factors. And, it, and I think uh, within that, I mean, there's... Um, one of the biggest mistakes we see, certainly with, with businesses, is not them taking on too much debt in one sense, but it's not having sufficient working capital in order to be able to get through a period of growth, of, of coming out of something like this and being able to survive. So whilst debt can be perceived as a negative in terms of the balance sheet impact, the corresponding Part to that is that as long as you're sensible with the, the cash that you get as a result of it, then it provides opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, any, any debt situation is going to require looking at, at the affordability. You know, that it comes back to, to Frank's point about the plan and that having a, a sensible plan where you can see, well, this is what we're going to 
to generate in order to be able to service the debt and debt, debt service. And, you know, if you can get a relatively long amortization period against your property, that might generate enough cash for you to invest in stock. The stock can turn, you can get the cash in and you can restore the business. So, it, you know, the long term, short term argument perhaps doesn't work if you need, if you need that money to get the, the, the business back on its feet. Yeah. And as you say, um, one of the one of the possibly most difficult um, issues that is is around lending at the moment is the impact of, of HMRC's preferential status. So for, with VAT, with PAY and IC, they now rank ahead. And clearly from a lender's point of view, they're looking at recoverability in, in, in the event of an insolvency, apart from leaving servicing to one side. And therefore the government has very much stepped up. But of course, at the same time, the government has started to become or has become over the last 18 months the lender of choice and with that we have the the latest iteration being the, the recovery loan scheme yeah. so as, as an option for debt can you talk us through the recovery loan scheme yeah so this is this is the as you say the latest iteration of the government support it replaces the seagulls and, and and bounce back loan and i think the first thing to say is that you you can take a recovery loan scheme on top of those so that, that the government will allow you to to add to the existing facilities that you have in place um, there are there are limits on the amount you can borrow you know there are there are set limits in terms of if it's 10 million or 25 um, percent of turnover or double your wages bill so you know those those are set in in, in stone you can work those out there's a, there's also a, a an underlying limit that is what is the most the business can afford what is the liquidity requirement so actually there's quite a subjective element to that as well so so the recovery loan scheme will involve much more sitting down and talking to your lender about what you need and how you're going to repay it what it what it specifically does is allow lenders to overlook any short-term medium-term problems caused by the pandemic now again you know that, that's <laughs> there's a bit of opening pandora's box what's a short-term problem that's been called by the pandemic why rising wages is that a problem caused by the pandemic you know not people get is is the is the um, loss of trade from physical stores something to do with the pandemic, or is that just a longer term decline in in marketing in in, in, in markets in towns? You know, different lenders will take different views as to what constitutes something that's a problem in the short to medium term because of the pandemic. So it's going to be a very difficult facility to be able to say, you know, to do a one size fits all. It's all going to be about speaking to the lenders. Clearly, if you've got a civil scheme in place, you've probably got a lender that understands the story, knows the backstory. Now, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. If you've done a good job, you've kept them informed and they trust you as a management team, then they'll probably be supportive. If you've got what's you know, effectively known as lender fatigue, then you, you, you might be better off looking elsewhere. So again, there's a, a number of things you have to take into account. And just, just to come back on your point on the preferential claim, I think that will require a little bit more thinking about how you might fund stock so you, you might fund stock by looking at trade finance trade finance is a different way of funding stock it, it's, a, it's a much more specialist way of funding stock if you're bringing stuff in from abroad that might be an option and, and obviously electrical goods often will be coming in, imported obviously the other thing is, is to look at your suppliers frank talked about getting the stakeholders on board the suppliers may be someone who are prepared to extend terms they may be prepared to grant you a loan or, or even send you stock for gratis for in the short term because it may be that their sales is important to them so keeping you alive keeping the business alive as a, as a route to market may be very important to them uh, and, and another stakeholder you might talk to about you know keeping the, the costs on, under control when you're looking at plans is employees and whether you might you know be able to come up with an employee scheme that allows you to, to cap the cost of the employees but give some away some of the upside to them as, as, as part of just making sure you're optimizing the funding options opportunities so the, the i mean the moral of that tale carl to me seems to be that you you know to some extent you you've got to think outside the box and and not not simply see it as black and white just because you have someone you owe money to it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that they can't be advantageous to how you manage your cash going forwards and support you as long as you've got that line of communication and that's that's the same with all suppliers the suppliers of money as, as anything else and and you know i think it's also worth bearing in mind look at the, a lot of the information that's coming out or a lot of the reports coming out at the moment is there's probably an undersupply of finance there's a lot of smes that are looking to borrow money lenders are in a position where they probably can pick and choose who they lend money to so if you're someone who's a bit truculent or doesn't give them the information they want they're not going to lend money to you so it's all about managing those relationships 
Yeah, and and I I I had another question that I was going to ask you, and it, and it dovetails nicely into a question that's coming from um, a, a, an anonymous attendee. I don't know whether that's purposeful or, or or by coincidence, but but so I was going to ask you about what challenges to lenders face as a result of um, the likelihood that a lot of businesses have, have taken on security when they've taken on C bills, etc. But but the question from our attendee is. Do you have a view on lender appetite to provide funding as we move into a post-pandemic world? We hear about this wall of money in PE, but are there new lenders coming along? Are there, you know, is there a lot of appetite out there to lend? There are a lot of new lenders and they're, and they're very keen to have the opportunity to look at, at, at lending situations. You know, they, they are small, they very quickly get bandwidth issue so you know you, you you almost have to know who who's busy on what to be able to find someone who's got the ability to, to look at a, a situation sensibly um you know and and that applies you know even even the likes of think cats were a pretty well established lender went through a re refinance last year which is all positive they're getting more fund on but a lot of attention focused on getting that money in and and they went quiet and and, and you know they were just not able to deal with things for a couple of months while they sorted that out so so you get a lot more of that with this alternative finance challenger bank kind of situation than you would get with the high street so historically the high street was all set up for, for lending money and you could go and talk to anyone at any time and they had a reasonably understandable policy as to how they would go obviously within that policy you'd have individual um viewpoints it's much more varied landscape that there are people who will lend in any given point of the risk scale and there are people who will look for a return according to that risk but that as i say there, there isn't a bottomless pit of money out there there's a lot of money but it it's you've got to know where to find it you've got to know who to speak to you can spend a lot of time speaking to people who then you know actually say well we can't do that but we can do this you've got to have a pretty good understanding of what you need and why you need it and it comes back to frank's point about having the business plan right having the right people and speaking to the right people otherwise you could go down a lot of dead ends and and time is the one commodity that we don't have a lot of and, and mark us um going back to your point on purchasing stock um he had a, a recent case where a client required uh, support and and the supplier initially asked for a letter of credit the client's bank supported the request of request for the letter of credit but requested the client offer funds to cover the letter um so that they were set aside in a segregated account which which rather defeats the object um, are you coming across this requirement on, on, on these types of loans? Yeah, cashback guarantees or personal guarantees are very much to the fore at this lower end of, of the market, SME, lower mid-market. You, you, you will see that. And, and I think, as we've just said, that, that there are lenders, they've got a lot of choice. There's a lot of people who are looking to borrow money. If you don't believe in the business, then they're not going to believe in the business. I think cashback is difficult because, as you rightly say, that means you've got to find the cash when you're looking for cash. Personal guarantees are something that obviously people take a... a, a a view on and that each person has their own individual approach to that but at the end of the day if you're if you're asking the lender to put money into a situation there's a lot of uncertainty about if if you say turn around and say to them oh no i, I don't want to personally guarantee it because i'm not sure what's going to happen but chances are that's going to raise a red flag in their credit team thanks carl so moving moving on then from debt to the idea of of cash generation or as adam says i'm contractually obliged to say <laughs> necessarily cash generation but hmrc debt reduction uh the r d world is is an increasingly prevalent area in terms of businesses um in in our in our case study um what what cs did was was take time over the last 18 months to use some of its funds to uh, redevelop its its software to integrate systems for its online business and um and, and invested in that area. So before we go into what is and isn't reclaimable, um, Adam, could you give us some background to the R&D scheme? Yes, thanks Simon, yeah, and good morning everyone. Um, absolutely, yeah, so the scheme started in 2000 and it's a government incentive to reward uh, limited companies and PLCs, uh, as well as other uh, registered companies uh, into developing new science and technology. That's, that's the remit of the scheme. And it works retrospectively. So probably the best way to think about it is like a reverse grant. So this is this is money that's already been spent by the company um, on and resources onto R and D and developing their their technology and their systems. Um, and you can go back to financial accounting periods. You know, you know, 
uh, to adjust your corporation tax. It works through the corporation tax system. Um, and typically, you know, you, you can claim sort of roughly 25 to sort of up to even up to 33% uh, of those R&D eligible R&D costs, um, depending on, on, on the financial situation of the business. And you're looking at the development of new products, new processes, uh, new services, and in this scenario, yeah, new software and new systems um, for technology, for the development of, uh, you know, their own internal sort of warehousing systems or their own uh, you know, innovative ERP systems, etc. You know, what we've got to be careful of is, is, is what does qualify and what doesn't qualify. And, that, and that's, you know, that's where uh, the scheme sort of you know, has its difficulties, is, is understanding that. And in that regard, Adam, so, so before we move on to those specifics, what's the take up like on the scheme generally? I mean, yeah, I mean, HMRC did a study sort of seven, eight years ago, and, they, and it was sort of less than 10% of, of what they thought was eligible schemes, eligible, eligible companies were, were taking up in the scheme. That was very, very low. So they, had, they have sought to expand the... Uh, you know the distribution of the, of the of this money and encourage companies to claim um and in recent years that you know that has been the case there has been a strong uptake in r d claims over recent years um and, and the government statistics sort of back that up in in all sectors as well as you know manufacturing which is the core sort of manufacturing engineering which was the core sort of element of the scheme um and and so this it's a funny way to think about it you know hmrc and 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 a, HM Treasury are actively trying to give this money away. Increasing R&D spend universally is seen as a good thing. And, you know, for every sort of pound in the, in the SME area that the government invests in this R, in the R&D tax credit scheme, it roughly gets two to two and a half, you know, um, times of that back in, in extra R&D spend. So you, you, get some, you get a bang for your buck, as it were. And, you know, keeping yourself ahead of the competition internationally is the whole rationale behind the scheme. And uh, this is one avenue amongst others, you know, with grant funding and other, and other innovation funding uh, is one avenue that, that governments are seeking to do this. And, and, you know, bearing in mind take up has increased, but, but, but is certainly not at the levels that you would hope it would be, given that it, for lots of businesses, you know, it's, it's money they're simply leaving on the table. Mm. What, are the, what are the common misconceptions? Why don't people, um, do it and what are you know bearing in mind that I, as i understand it you guys at rand have a hundred percent record on reclaiming money what what are the the common mistakes that 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 people may make in trying to put forward r d claims yeah i mean absolutely i mean the most common one is that they've not heard of the scheme you know that it's you know it is a very very tiny part of the of the overall uh, tax code um it's not widely understood by businesses and the accountancy network in general, but that has changed. You know that has changed very much in recent years. It is widely more understood and widely more accepted amongst the whole business and accounting sort of network, and that is a good thing. You know that you know as I said before, the government is seeking to expand its R and D spend throughout UK PLC. So, you know, one of the other sort of things is so well they, when companies do look into it, they think well th this is either too good to be true. Or I don't qualify, you know, that is quite quite often. But actually, you know, the legislation itself, whilst HMRC have seek to clarify what they mean by R and D, you know, it, it isn't down to sort of pure blue sky thinking. It is looking to reward that daily R and D solution, product development, uh, process development that are is overcoming problems and developing uh, technologies and developing new science and new thinking and new knowledge on a daily basis, which is overcoming problems all the time. So it's that activity, that, that uncertainty, it's all it's all about is, is uncertainty and risk that companies engage in on an almost daily activity. It, it, they don't qu quite often understand that that actually, that is to be rewarded. So from your point of view, typically, um, you, know, you receive a phone call from CS saying, Adam, we think we might have an R&D claim. What, what does the process look like and how long, how long, generally speaking, would you expect it to take from the start to um, HMRC writing you a nice letter saying you've got a credit? Yeah, well, I mean, as this, you know, in terms of 
So the first thing is to, is to say, well, what activity is it that you're doing? Is it eligible to begin with? You know, so in this space, you know, software is a tricky sort of area in general. It's, it's less tangible. Uh, HMRC are trying to clarify what they mean by an advance in software and, and systems and technology development in that space. Um, that is something that has, has been difficult to sort of understand and, and, and comprehend. You know, so you've got to show, well, certain things are not going to be R&D. The website development, the web development and the e-commerce platform probably isn't going to be R&D. But those back end systems that you can't buy off the shelf or you've had to significantly develop off the shelf solutions or bring numerous off the shelf systems together into a, into an entirely new system. Now, that would qualify as R&D. You know, you are advancing the thinking and the, and the knowledge and the science as it, behind it, you know. And, and, and that investment, you know, whether that's internal staff and whether that's subcontracted staff and, and other material costs, software costs, um, those costs we can work out, you know, retrospectively about what they've spent in the past. And HMRC do understand that, you know, companies haven't kept records retrospectively, but there are processes that we can use to sort of, you know, fairly estimate those costs, uh, you know, looking backwards, as it were. So... Once we've got that all the information in, and we've got the technical information, so the submission requires a technical report that explains what the advance in knowledge and science and technology is, and what the technological landscape was, you know, why the company is seeking to advance on that. You know, the, the overall process itself, you know, is typically, um, so the submission process might take two, two to three to four weeks, and then HMRC have a 30-day sort of turnaround target, which broadly the the key to maybe a little bit more, you know, sort of four to six weeks in the SME space, the, the RDEC, the larger companies it takes, it takes a bit longer. But yeah, they aim to turn it around in, in sort of four to six weeks. And, and by and large, you know, that, that is it. And, it, and, it, it's a, and if you now, if there is an HMR, see your ears, absolutely. It's, an, it's, a, it's a cash credit back into the business. Yes, if there are other arrears in HMRC, HMRC will you know, look at those and, and, and absorb those themselves. But obviously that reduces your debt on, on the balance sheet itself. But yeah, we've had scenarios where that, that hasn't been the case. And we have saved, almost saved in inverted commas, a couple of companies where you know, put an R&D claim in and, and, it's, and it's enabled them to continue trading. That has happened um, in the past. It's absolutely, and people don't understand that this, this money is, is available and the government are seeking to give it away. It's, it's, a, it's a generous cash injection to the business. Yeah, well, never, never more so when, when a lot of businesses will have built up HMRC debt, and this is a way to, to reduce some of that debt. So my final, my final question to you at this point, Adam, is are HMRC bracing themselves for a significant claim from Virgin <laughs> Galactic? Is that, is that ne are we all going to start funding uh, Richard Branson going, to the, going, to, going into outer space? Uh, maybe not. I, I mean, I mean... From a from a global sort of political perspective, the scheme has wide cross party support. It was introduced by the Labour governments, expanded by the coalition governments, expanded further by the Conservative government. As I say, it's, it's not very well known. It's not widely talked about in the political circles. Um, it sort of goes under the radar, as it were. It, it's, it is in legislation till twenty twenty four, and by and large, you know, policies that that actually seek to reduce R and D spend are a pretty illogical. If, you know, from from a political sort of perspective and an international perspective. So, you know, whilst you, you know, I haven't got a crystal ball, I don't know. This, the nature of the scheme might change. It might become more or less generous. I don't know. But I think schemes like this, uh, well, we should call it an incentive. That's one of the problems. It's called a scheme, but actually it's an incentive. It, it, scheme has those particular connotations. It, it is a government incentive. And, um, you know, I think by and large, HMRC, you know, they've employed... They, they want to police the scheme a lot better. They've recently employed a lot more officials. So, which we've been calling out for, you know, we, we want this, you know, tax bits, taxpayers money at the end of the day, we want it distributed fairly. Uh, and that, and HMRC are, I think, seeking to do that now. I think, I think they are clarifying what they mean by R&D. And I think they're hoping to police the scheme in a much more straightforward and, and quicker way. Uh, there's still a few hurdles on that, but that by and large, I think that's what they're trying to do. And, and Anthony asks, um, could you explain the impact of furlough payments on R and D claims? But I'm assuming, I'm assuming, if someone is is being paid to stay at home, then you can't. There, well, there is no claim in relation to salaries. Absolutely, yeah. So, so any top ups and furlough uh, in this regard, you know, if you're at home not working, you can't be doing R and D. Um, and 
but actually, you know, we've seen it yet, yeah, as Simon, you mentioned earlier, a lot of companies actually have used this as an opportunity to think, well, okay, we'll, we'll not furlough our staff. We'll, we'll actually invest a bit more time and resources into developing that project that, that we've never really got around to. We have seen that actually. Um, they have used the time wisely in, in that technological space. Whereas other companies, yes, R&D has, has been shelved and they've just focused on trying to survive. Uh, but, but from furlough itself, yeah, if, if you're not at work, you, yeah, so those, those costs have to be deducted from, from the NER, the NER and D. I think it's worth worth saying. Sorry, just to butt in, but it is worth saying that furlough doesn't fall under any of the government. You know, that that money isn't doesn't build up and, and need to be repaid. So if, no, I don't. That I know, was yeah. the point of the question. Does it? You know, are you? Yeah, and, I, and as a grant itself, because obviously grant funding can Im impact R and D tax credits. Um, it, it, it's not strictly it's not state aid from that you know from that perspective. So it, you know, it's not it's not like an innovation UK grant, which can affect you know uh, the. Yeah, an SME uh, already tax credit claim. Um, it, so, but they do, those costs do have to be eliminated, yes. Thanks, Adam. Um, so moving from R&D to, to the tax advisory side and Holly, I mean, our, our case study, Holly, is a, is a business which has had its challenges, is look, still has a, you know, a, a bright future as long as it's got the right working capital. But I know you are a strong advocate in making sure in these situations that, that the right structures are in place to manage the tax going forwards and also indeed look into the future mm. and you know if it's looking at for example disposal of the the physical side or indeed it's looking at trying to engage with employees more mm. now now i think you would argue is the time to do so so if we can explore that a bit further first of all from a point of view of that the the physical side the company that holds freehold property what what are the types of um, of of areas that that management should be considering from a tax perspective in 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 managing those situations? Yeah, absolutely. And just to say, um, sorry if I freeze. I'm having a little bit of trouble with my video, so um, apologies if if that happens. So we've got this group, um, one side doing pretty well, one side not doing very well, and the side not doing very well is the more traditional business, which is holding real estate assets. So the management have got a couple of things to think about there. First of all, they've got presumably quite valuable real estate assets. Do they need to protect those from the losses that are bubbling up in that physical company? Do we need to think about moving the property assets away from that trade so that there isn't any chance of losing those valuable assets because you know the company gets into trouble? On a sort of wider uh, viewpoint, do management want to think now about, you know, these two things aren't really complementary. One might be dragging down the other going forward. Maybe we want to focus more on online, maybe get rid of retail. Um, and often a good way to approach that is to split the group um, now because you're thinking, well, these things aren't going to be together going forward. We might sell one before the other. We might get an interested buyer on one side, not the other. And it's really a good idea from a tax point of view to do what we call demerger, which is just splitting the group basically. So it's held directly under the shareholders rather than under one holding company with two subsidiaries. Um, and if it's structured properly, we can do all of that without triggering any tax cost, which is great because obviously usually moving, but particularly real estate assets around triggers all sorts of tax costs. So we can do this demerger. We have to do it um, not not in in the immediate expectation of a sale of one side of the business so it's not something you can do at the last minute it's something that has to be done a bit in advance um so we could look at maybe having online held one group physical held in a separate group so they can be sold separately they can be managed separately they can be funded separately you know one doesn't need to bring the other down in terms of borrowing that kind of thing um also, the other thing that we can do, which is really great, and the government acknowledge that this is OK, this happens, is that sometimes when we can structure these demergers, we can do what's called rebasing the property. So this business has been around for a long time. It could well be the case that a lot of those property assets were bought years and years ago. They've got a very low base cost in the company. If we structure the demerger right, 
we can uplift those assets to a current market value without triggering any tax. We get a tax-free uplift, which is just fantastic, you know, for assets that have been held for a long time. So if the company does want to maybe sell on some of those assets, realise some cash, pay down some debt, there won't be that heavy tax cost associated with it. So that's, you know, really nice little tweak that we can do um, on a demerger. The other thing to think about is that if you are thinking of selling at some point in the future, we often find that the buyer won't give value, proper value for property assets held within a company unless they really, really want that property. So let's say your trade's worth 10 million, your property's worth 10 million, the buyer's not going to give you 20 million. They'll give you 15 million. You know, they're just not going to give you value for the, for the property assets. So often people, it's advantageous to bring the property assets out hold them separately so that you can sell the trading business and you can sell maybe the property separately or do a sale and lease back or whatever to get to, you know, make sure you're getting value for your property assets. And th that, that element of, um, of, of planning and clearly what we're talking about here is, you know, it go, go, going back to the, 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 what we started with the concept of the business plan and, and being able to look ahead. As you say, this is about, this is about not what you're going to do three weeks from now in terms of selling a business, but possibly three, five years from now. Or even a year, yeah. And does the um, does the the impact on the business as it stands today from the last 18 months, does it have an advantage on doing the demerger at a time like this? Or is it is it not consequential in that way? Um, it's not particularly consequential um, the revenue are, are quite open to these demergers you know they understand that people need to restructure their group mm -hmm. and so you know sometimes it can it can add to the kind of commercial rationale for why you're doing it that you've got a struggling business and a non-struggling business but but because we can do the whole thing tax-free we're not triggering any tax liabilities so we don't have to worry about the value on which we're triggering them and from, from a point of view, I, I have a question here. The demerger de oh, point is interesting. Is there an optimum time frame to do Should there be a sale being considered yet to be defined? So I think I think your your view is probably you know a year beforehand at least. Yeah, I I don't like to try and do one if a sale is active. You know, if we if you've got corporate finance advisors out there looking for a buyer. You know, we can try it. You can try disclosing it to the revenue, but they don't really like doing it as as sort of direct pre-sale planning. It's something really that you want to be doing before you go into an active sale process. Um, I've done demergers where we've been very upfront and said, you know, we are going to think about selling parts of this, you know, depending on what buyer comes first. So it's not that you can never sell it. Um, If you use the kind of demerger we use, there are different kinds of demergers. Some of them you get in big trouble if you sell, you know, within a year or two afterwards, but not the kind of demerger we use, yeah. Understood. And looking at a, a, another aspect of the tax, the tax planning size that we're Holly, or certainly the, 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 the optimization going forwards, one way potentially to, to, to keep engaging in the business is employees is, is, is the future management is, is, is those types of people. And especially at times when, when, when you may have people who are concerned or, or demotivated by the, by the impact that the pandemic has had on the business. So the share, share schemes in businesses, am I right in thinking that the, the current balance sheet impact, the potential devaluation of shareholdings does have a benefit in looking at those types of schemes at a time like this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're right. So, you know, share incentives are seen as motivational, um, particularly if there's, an, you know, a, a chance that this thing's going to be sold in, in the, you know, medium, short to medium term. Um, the issue we have when we give employees share incentives is that the revenue comes say, well, look, if you give them shares that are worth 100 grand and they don't pay 100 grand, that's employment income with all the hideous tax consequences that go with that. So if, if share values are a little bit depressed at the moment because things have been tough, 
this is a really good time to put in place those share incentives because we can argue a much lower valuation with the revenue, which just decreases the cost for everybody involved. It, you know, management can get in at a reasonable price without triggering some horrible um, you know, tax liabilities for them. And, and the other thing about share scheme, Simon, is that we've been talking about the fact that this company is short of cash. Now, they're probably not going to be able to pay people bonuses. So how about you give them share incentives in place of their bonuses? You know, it's a, it's a cash free way of, of still feeling like you're rewarding people in situations where it's tough, you know, to actually fund that cash cost them immediately. Yes. Are, are we, are, I mean, is the UK, I don't, I, um, is, is it more common to see share incentive schemes abroad? Are we quite, are we quite, um, averse to them or, or do you see quite a lot of share incentive schemes? Yeah, I see a lot of them. They're very, very common. I think um, sometimes if you've got family owned companies, they kind of, it's never really kind of, they've never really thought about it particularly. They're like, oh, don't really want to have shareholders. You know, my employee don't really want them to be shareholders. We don't want them in, in shareholder meetings. We don't want them voting, you know, that kind of thing, which is where something called a share option scheme comes in. So, that means you're kind of giving your employees a right to a share, but they don't actually become shareholders until the very last minute just before they leave or you sell the company. So you never have to worry about people turning up to shareholder meetings or, you know, objecting to whatever you're planning on doing with the company. And I think if, if people could think in that in that way more, then, then that maybe breaks down some of the resistance to having employee shareholders on, on board. But yeah, we, we are seeing an awful lot of share incentive schemes. I think they are becoming more and more popular. And I've got a question here from Jerry, and I'm hoping that you know the abbreviation because I'm not sure I do, or maybe I'm being a bit sick. Seeing a lot of EOTs being used for non-family owned companies, any comments? Um, EOTs, you know, they are they're great things. You can't, you, can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't just say EOT and move on, Holly. What is an EOT? Yeah, EOT, brilliant, yeah. <laughs> Employee Ownership Trust. So um, people say look at the John Lewis model. I think Richard Sounds did it recently. Um, if oh, Down where I am, Riverford, who are an organic farm, they've also done it. So the idea is um, the company is sold to a trust, which is is for the benefit of the employees past, future, present. Okay. The, the exciting thing about selling to an EOT is that um, if it's done right, the vendor pays no tax, none at all. You know, so they can sell their company for 10 million pounds and it's tax free. Yeah, that's, that's massively attractive from a tax point of view. It's something that I would say it's not a one size fits all. Um, there are tax problems. If you don't structure it right, you won't get into that that tax free, useful place. Um, and also, you do have to think seriously about: Do you have the trustees? Do you have the, the the management team? All that in place to keep the company running properly while it's under an EOT. So it's it's not something that should be done on without thinking it through. But in the right scenario, it can be a really great thing. Thanks, Holly. So I think. A number of the factors we've touched on here are based around the opportunities, um, how management can be clever about, um, about, about preserving money, raising money, um, getting money back from HMRC, hopefully at times. Um, but of course, it, it, it's predicated on the idea that the company survives, um, which, is, which is likely to be a big issue for a lot of businesses coming out of the pandemic. And, you know, in, in, in my world, I live in uh, it, looking at insolvency statistics and seeing that lots of companies that, that possibly arguably should have been um, one of the, the numbers that, that went into process didn't. And the, the, presumably the follow on from that is because of the level of government support and the understandable bubble that's been put around. But one of the challenges that, that I think a lot of businesses are going to face in terms of um, raising debt is that, of course, with the debt comes the personal responsibility and leaving to one side the obligations of management. One of the big issues for me seems to be the, the uh, provision of PGs. So from your point of view, Frank, um, what are the types of considerations that, that, that a director is going to have to take into account 
when the bank is saying we will lend you the money, but we need a PG. Sure. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think as has been said on the call, and I, I know that the, the point Carl made around what actually from a lender perspective, if a management team or owner manager is not willing to put a PG in, what, that, what does that say about the level of belief they have in the, um, you know, in the company's uh, viability uh, and ultimately future? Uh, and to me, that, that is a key point in terms of that consideration. So as an owner manager, um, the shareholder being asked for a PG, I think it really, you have to really assess your risk, what is your risk reward appetite? Okay, and actually from a risk perspective is it comes back again to my favorite talking point of data, quality of information is absolutely key. So actually, again, going back to the business plan, the revised business plan, do you really believe in that business plan? Okay, what do the forecast say, the sensitized version of those forecasts in terms of actually the viability of the business in the short to medium term is growth, is growth prospects? What's the, macro, what's the macro data saying to you about the wider industry within which the business is operating? And is this a viable business in a viable sector that has growth potential? So actually, if I was in that position, I'd be looking at, well, or answering all those questions and then putting a cap on top of it to say, what are the multiples that I'm likely to get if this business was to really go to where we hope it's going to go to? You then bring that back to actually, well, that's the potential upside. Actually, have you got the wherewithal to actually give a PhD? I think actually, you know, I would always urge individuals to act responsibly when giving PGs and actually make sure you've considered the personal aspects and the assets that you have and your family circumstance before giving that PG, ultimately. Um, and so I think that's, that's, that's an absolutely key consideration for people to bear in mind. Um, and ultimately as well is, I think sometimes from experience, some individuals will give PGs not re or gambling that the lender ultimately for reputation purposes would actually call, call in that PG when it comes to the crunch. Um, I think it would be remiss of, of my view anyway for people to adopt that mentality. If you're given a PG, you need to go into it with your eyes open understanding what the downside could be and that potentially you could lose your shirt if it's called in. And I think, I mean, I think you and I, Frank, both, both operate in a world where we, we assume that most PGs are there as, a, as an incentive as opposed, to a, as opposed to a last resort for a lender, albeit clearly, you know, when the PG's got value, um, it, it, will, it will be called upon if necessary. But Carl, from your, from your point of view, um, do lenders see PGs as an important part of the of the package, um, or is 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 it only an important part because they want to know that management have bought into what they're saying they're going to do? Uh, yeah. So let me quickly first make the point that under the recovery loan scheme, there's a there's a, a prohibition on taking PGs for any lending below two fifty, and there's a prohibition across the board against taking PGs secured against your primary residential property. So that's an important point about the RLS. In terms of, of PGs, yeah, the, the, the lenders that operate in that small, medium size, where essentially the value is all about the owner, the shareholders, it's, it's, it's usually, you know, a family business or it's a business that, that's, that's generally very much run by the, by the, the, the small team of management. So, you know, it, it is important that they support the business when it's going through difficulties. So what a lender doesn't want to do is find out that they're the ones who are being left holding the baby and trying to get money back. And the people who've got the business into this situation can go off into the sunset without, without any financial obligation. And, and financial obligation tends to talk a lot more loudly than moral obligation. That, that's not always the case, but across the broad experience of lenders is if people haven't got a PG, then they will provide less value in the exit or turnaround stage of a business than if they have got a PG. Carl, you've just, you've, you've, you've thrown me into a whole new world of issues there, because I'm now, I'm now imagining the case where, where someone owns their house, has, has taken that loan, and then takes their 200,000 cash at bank and pays off their mortgage just before the, uh, just before the, the the PG gets called in, and there's the prohibition on their primary residence, so it's it no doubt leads to some some interesting situations. But I mean, from I suppose one of the big aspects of all of this, lenders to one side, albeit they are a lender now, is HMRC. Uh, what are the views of the the panel on on HMRC's appetite going forwards? But both in terms of from Adam's point of view, 
how they tighten up their regulations to try and avoid paying out more money to Holly and, you know, will they try and curtail, um, curtail um, tax opportunities to, to, to minimize outflow? And, you know, for the likes of you, Frank, um, are they going to be more aggressive at collecting in money? Anybody, anybody can speak at this point, by the way. Well, if, if, I, if I just go first quick and then, and then leave the floor to the, to the tax guys. So I think from in terms of um, appetite, I mean, yes, I think HMRC politically and internally will always have the mindset that they want to be more aggressive in terms of going after people. The issue that I believe they face is bandwidth. And have they got enough resource, given all the pl plethora of new schemes and considerations they have been interested with? Have they got the bandwidth to really do that? Okay, so, shall I jump in there? Um, on that point, actually, we we understand that the revenue are moving a lot of people onto um, the um, the furlough scheme, the job uh, job retention scheme, and um, payments to put some focus on getting back money that people shouldn't have claimed under that under that scheme you know they're moving people off other stuff and onto that and also keeping people that they were going to make redundant they've kept them on longer in order to staff up that side of things i think there's no question that the revenue are going to be quite motivated to get back in money where it shouldn't have gone um and also potentially with the budgets coming up you know with the whole the whole signaling about financial responsibility and all that and how we've got so badly in debt that they are probably going to be closing down some benefits, um, some reliefs, potentially also, of course, putting tax rates up. You know, we've been expecting that for a while and I, it's going to happen. It's just a question of, you know, which year um, they decide to do it. Adam, now, now Polly's brought us down. Can you just bring us back up? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, on a positive note, yeah, from, from an R&D perspective, actually, ironically, as, as I mentioned before, HMRC and the Treasury are actively trying to give this money away. They do want to police the scheme better. They want, they want it to be distributed fairly, and they, they're actively trying to do that. But typically, you know, if they do want to raise an inquiry, that's prior to they've paid the money out. So, you know, they, they're not trying to claw it back. Yes, there is a 12 month window which HMRC can do, can run an inquiry after paying the, the, the tax credit out. But actually, you know, tip, in most cases, they, they actually do the inquiry beforehand. Now, that, that, they may change that situation where they pay the money, so it's pay first, check later. And um, we've sort of seen there, there's yeah. been a move to that. But actually, in the R&D space, yeah, going go back to the original point, it, it is fundamental part of the government's overall strategy is to increase R&D spend uh, overall in the, in, in the UK. Um, it, it actively promotes economic growth and in turn the idea is, is that that should generate greater tax revenue in the future from not only corporation tax but also other sources as well. So they see it as an investment and by and large that is, that is true. So you know they, they, they do want the uptake of the scheme to continue to rise. There you go. There's the positive note. Thank you for that, Adam. Um, so I think to summarise on this, I mean, business plan is key, isn't it? Um, knowing, knowing what you're trying to achieve. But, but, but the planning part of that being really important in terms of looking forwards, looking at what you want out of your business, looking at where you want to go, looking at those parts that you may want to, 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 to manage out over time. And, and making sure you've got the right advisors in there to, to be able to do that and to optimise the business going forwards. So I think I now, I now definitely am contractually advised to say that's all we have time for. Thank you so much to those who have joined us. Please take some time to register for our next webinar in the series discussing how to maximise your business as we come out of the pandemic. Uh, we'll be looking at business diversification, distressed M&A, structuring deals and tax strategies to support transactions. That's on Friday the 30th of July at the same time, 9.30 a.m. And you can find more information on the events pages of the K3 Hub website. Lastly, thank you very much to Frank, Adam, Holly and Carl for taking the time to share their knowledge, expertise and experience. Have a great weekend, everyone.